Hi, y'all. I'm Richard Santucci, and I'm one of the surgeons at the Tr Crane Center for Transgender Surgery. You know, uh, we are uh, one of the most accomplished and uh, busy transgender surgery centers in the world. And honestly, we're proud of that. And I realize that a lot of times when I speak to my patients, they ask me a very reasonable question. Who the heck are you and how did you get here? So I thought I would answer that question for you guys today. Uh, so I'm a physician, I'm a surgeon, I'm a type of surgeon called a urologist, and usually a urologist deals uh, with medical and surgical problems of the urinary tract. Uh, I also am a reconstructive urologist, and because of my long interest in reconstructive urology, uh, I saw out of the corner of my eye some absolutely fascinating work happening in the transgender field, and I wasn't part of it, and that wasn't okay with me. So. Uh, what I did was I conspired together with Dr. Crane. Uh, I had 18 years of experience in the field, uh, knew a lot about reconstructive urologists. He was one of the most accomplished in uh, phalloplasty uh, and other transgender surgery uh, surgeons in the country, and we schemed to get together. Uh, we didn't know how long it would take to uh, make it so I'm operating at the same level as he was. Uh, we actually scheduled five months for this. So that would be five months of every day, working in the clinic, working in the operating room. But the truth of the matter is, uh, it really only took a short period of time uh, to translate uh, the surgical skills that I had gotten over the decades into uh, this new, for me, field uh, years ago. So how does it all start? Well, like uh, every doctor in North America, I went to college. Uh, I was interested in medical school, but I was also interested in science. And this is gonna be an important theme uh, throughout this because I really am a sort of uh, surgeon researcher, surgeon scientist. Um, and in college, I uh, worked uh, two and a half years doing uh, neurological research and I published my first paper. I was really happy. Now, did I publish my first paper all on my own? No, my professors helped me incredibly. I had no idea what I was doing. Then I went to medical school at the Baylor College of Medicine uh, in Houston, uh, Texas. I loved medical school. I was finally in the place I felt I needed to be. And uh, once things calmed down in medical school, I, as soon as I could get into it, I began doing research uh, again. Uh, I knew I was interested in urology, so I did urology research, and I started to get the next papers that I uh, was able to publish. I was able to match uh, into a urology uh, residency program in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and uh, that was really great for me. It was a high volume center, the very, very good surgeons, very high uh, volume and acuity center. So I really learned uh, my craft uh, over a six year period. But in that time, I also stepped up my research efforts. So I was able to do a, a full year in the lab, which is a little bit unusual as a resident because I liked it and I was good at it. Uh, and uh, I began publishing the sort of next sets of papers that I was um, uh, responsible for. At that point, I knew I wanted to go into academic medicine, and often in that case, you do something called a fellowship. So a fellowship is training after the residency. Uh, and I applied to what at the time was one of the only few K, uh, spots in America where you could study reconstructive urology. I was really interested in reconstructive urology. And I got a spot with a guy named Jack McInerney at University of California, San Francisco. But ah, uh, there was a catch. The catch was the job wasn't to start for two years uh, into the future. Oh no, what to do for two years? Well, I was always so very interested in research. I wanted to be an academic uh, surgeon. So I applied for and got a uh, research only fellowship. That means I was in the lab with a pipette, you know, just like you've seen on TV uh, for two full years. And that was really good because um, I really wasn't a benchtop scientist at that time, uh, but doing benchtop science every day uh, really pushes you uh, into um, uh, a new skill set. Um, 
I was lucky to work at a very uh, good lab, a very smart lab, a very productive lab, but we also had sort of discovered something as a lab. And uh, just not to bore people, but just to quickly say, we discovered that the healing process starts at the moment of injury. Like you would imagine if I asked you, well, like, you know, when does healing really start? Does it start one millisecond after injury? You'd be like, no, maybe a day or two later. No, nope. we proved that it started the millisecond at the time of injury and that you could affect healing months or even years down the line by what you did at the moment of injury. If you think about surgery being kind of an injury, uh, this became uh, a really important and interesting uh, field of uh, study for someone like me who wants to be, a, who's a surgeon but who wants to make surgery uh, better. Uh, after that, I was able to go into um, my fellowship in San Francisco and I was really in heaven. Jack McAnich was the planet wide leader in urologic trauma or injuries and urologic reconstruction. Uh, I did a huge number of cases with him and learned his ways of doing things uh, and really became an experienced uh, trauma urologist. But also, I was able to begin really writing papers in earnest. In one very busy year, I wrote almost 26 papers, book chapters, and reviews. Um, it was hectic, but it was really like going to surgeon scientist boot camp. At that point, it's time to get a job. And I did the thing that you do, which is made a nationwide search. And I found what looked to me like the ideal position, which is to work uh, in Detroit. They had a very busy trauma center. That was something that I was good at. They didn't really have a lot of reconstructive urology, so that was something that I could take over. And I was confident that I would have a little bit of time and support to do my ongoing research. Um, and so for 18 years, that's what I did. I became a full professor of surgery in the year 2006. Um, and in the year 2007, I became the head of the uh, entire urology department in the Nine Hospital Detroit Medical Center. But during that time, I had residents, I had medical students, and I had fellows, and one of my new jobs wasn't just to do my own research, but to mentor other people into research. And what you end up with when you're an academic surgeon is that you have to keep a CV or a resume. You have to keep it in the format that your school requires. And so while it's a little bit douchey to uh, wave your CV at people, uh, I think it just makes a point of what I've been trying to do over the decades. So I have uh, 240 scholarly publications. That means uh, original research um, in peer-reviewed journals, uh, reviews, and reviews are very important. We'll go over some of those in subsequent videos, uh, book chapters, and even four uh, books that I either wrote or co-wrote uh, with other uh, people. You know, there's two things in this CV that I'm particularly proud of. One is visiting professorships. So when people want to turbocharge their understanding of a problem, they pick someone, they invite them to come to their center for one, two, three days, and you interact heavily, give a lot of lectures, um, you know, talk with the residents and, and really try and influence and, and teach those people. And I've been invited 40 different times to be a visiting professor. And I'm proud of that, you know, uh, to um, be the kind of surgeon that other surgeons want to understand uh, how, how you do what you do and, and uh, what you do uh, to, to achieve good results. And I think the, the final thing I'm really proud of is that, um, there are seven formal trips that I took to Africa. Early on, I was just a, a, a learner. You know, I went with experienced surgeons and I learned how to do good work in Africa. Uh, and then maybe in the middle of that time, I became sort of the co-leader of those groups. And then ultimately I ran those groups myself. It's really important to note, I wasn't going to do 10 surgeries on Africans. That's useful, but it's not very useful. What I was doing was teaching the local Africans how to use their own surgical set to get the same good results we were getting in North America. And you know, it's very rewarding work. Uh, I was able to go to the same centers in Mozambique and South Africa over and over and over again. 
uh, and work with the same people and keep building capacity. And in all of this 60 or 70 pages of nonsense, it's the thing I'm probably the most proud of. Anyway, who am I and how did I get here?